But check this out. Uh, one of my students was talking about how James Jamerson used to put a piece of foam under his strings. You know, talking like a prepared piano. There's like a prepared bass. And um, he took one of those magic sponges and broke off a piece and put it under his guitar thing. And uh, I just love it. It sounds so interesting. It's got sort of a... sound in a recording. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> it's quite like, a, like an effect, almost like it's compressed, but it's not compressed, but it's not ringing, but it's kind of muted, but it's kind of bell-like, but it's got a <laughs> it's very interesting. I'm going to record with it. I can't wait. Great, 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 great. I've always gotten excited about playing parts that are iconic, you know, things that you've just listened to a lot or have heard that just sounded so cool. And now you're able to create that sound yourself. I've always felt that we have that extra added magic because we get to participate with these sound waves. We get to make this noise, you know, uh, a lot of people can just appreciate music, but we get to create it. It's just uh, an amazing thing. And you've got to give yourselves credit because guitar isn't one of those easy instruments that you can just hit or strike and it sounds good. You know, to get it to sound good is your touch, your fingertips. So that's what we're all working at. And those are the things that we've talked about that like can't get notated. So when you're wanting it to sound like John or Paul or George or Ed Sheeran or James Taylor or Pat Metheny or George Benson or <laughs> Pat Martino or John Mayer, it's a certain touch. It's something that doesn't get notated. It's the difference, I think, between like a conductor being able to coax out music from a certain section in the orchestra and get it to come out and then be interpreted in a certain way. And, uh, I like when we have this sensitivity developed in our ears that we can hear those subtleties and try to pronunciate those differences to get those different characteristics in our playing. It's pretty amazing stuff. But the ones who have real finesse and real character and real magic and love in the notes, wow. That's, that's a whole other set of wow. <laughs> on guitar for me that I really, really enjoy. And I think as a recording engineer, it, you know, it's why it stands out so much to me. It's very different. You ever find that sometimes you go to play too many bar chords for too long and your hand goes, I'm about to fall off. <laughs> Our fingers are so used to doing what they do, you know? This is why I think the experience of playing other people's things are so important, but not just Beatles. I really think you should do it with like 14 different, completely different stylistic guitar players just to get that personality vibe into your playing. So you don't just always do what you always do. It's a very funny thing because anybody who comes to Berkeley will say to me, I want to grow. I want to change. I want to get better. I want to expand. I, I'm tired of what I do. I want to get more ideas and just broaden everything, you know, and you go, great, great. And then you tell them what to do and they go, mm. you know, like, is this what you have to do to get better? Uh, yeah. I remember taking a survey of guitar styles of bebop just because I knew it would stretch me and um, give me a hard time, basically. <laughs> uh, but there's so much chromaticism in it that, you know, very often, even if you're playing a line, uh, you know, they talk about all that indirect resolution and stuff in the, 
how you can approach a note like a you're trying to go from C to D, but you can sometimes go or or you know there's lots of ways to get to that target note and those half steps can be such buggers because you think you've heard it and then you realize I still haven't heard it correctly. Something still sounds weird. And you need those skills if you're going to be recording and overdubbing and sending people parts and, and sending people tracks. You need to be able to hear I'm in tune. I'm not in tune. It's buzzing in a weird way. It's not making me feel comfortable. It sounded better before. Oh, the string was more in tune before. Again, these are those things that people pay you more money because you hear the difference yeah. recording. I always, 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 always suggest that people, players, record themselves and videotape themselves a lot and watch them and listen and compare it to something that you think is a standard that you want to hold yourself to. Like you like the sound of this record or this player, you know, like keep comparing yourself to the things that you think are great so that you can get great. You have to be able to hear the difference. And if you can't, you need to develop how to hear that difference. And if you're not sure what it's going to take to get your playing to sound like that, you ask people like me, you know, you ask your teachers, you go to their office hours, you pick their brains, you talk to your private lesson teacher and say, listen to this recording, tell me why this doesn't sound the way I thought it sounded while I was playing it. Because when I'm playing, I'm having so much fun that I sometimes think, yeah, this is just awesome. And I remember taking some master classes with Mick Goodrick because he said he wanted to study with me. And I'm like, yeah, right. Okay. And um, it was because of these subtleties, because we were talking about violin players and how I had asked one of my friends who teaches at Berkeley, who also plays in the Boston Symphony, to come over and play this little beatly line on one of my songs. And she played it 14 different ways, expressing it in different ways. And each time she played the melody, it had a different emotion. And I was just so impressed. I was just like, what? You know, like, because if you put a bunch of notes down for any guitar player, they'd be go blink, 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 da ding, ding, ding. That's the rhythm. Those are the notes. That's what you've got. But again, it had no personality. It had no emotion. It wasn't filled with a particular magic she made it sound not only magical but 14 different types of magical so then she said sing it to me once and i sang it to her once and she played it back exactly how i sang it and triple tracked it for me every single time perfectly and i was so impressed by that and mick overheard me telling that story and he said i want to study with you because he liked that i was hearing those differences so while we're having lessons i'm feeling all you know overwhelmed pretty much because you know he's such a guru of the guitar and uh, i was in my 30s at the time and um i said to him you know even as a composer i've never even took any composition classes at berkeley i it's almost like i don't really even know what i'm doing when it comes to writing because i loved harmony classes so much but when i write it's like i'm not thinking of any of the stuff berkeley taught me i'm just writing i'm just feeling i'm just emoting and he said that's how you're supposed to write you're supposed to learn all of this stuff and sort of just do it naturally and i was so pleased to hear him say that because nobody ever really taught me how to write a song but here's where i get into trouble if i'm not bringing in the professor brain after i've written something i was actually playing with one of my drummers in my house playing a new song I'm totally in it. I'm just playing the chorus over and over and over. He's playing the drums. I'm playing the guitar. I'm having the best time, but I'm feeling like, damn, this guy's just not grooving with me, man. He's just not staying with me. I just need him to really hold in a pocket for me, you know? So I say this to the drummer and he goes, I'd really like to, but you keep speeding up every time you replay the chorus. <laughs> As you play the chorus over and over and over again, he said, you're just getting subtly faster and faster and faster. And I'm thinking, that's just not true. You know, like my time is good and I work on time and blah, 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 blah. So he leaves and I pull out a metronome. And for a minute and a half, I can't even play my own song. <laughs> 
<laughs> I cannot play it with the metronome because for some reason, when I'm in my little, you know, magic cloud of I've just written a song and I'm so happy and this is great, la 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 la. It's like I haven't floated back down to earth yet. It, it's not a grounded thing. Ever since that conversation, every single song I write, I ask myself and sit with the tune afterwards, is this the form you actually want? Is it in the best key for my voice? Is it actually a song that should stay in time? Or is it one of those songs of mine that starts around 92, goes to 94, goes back to 104, comes back down to 92? Is it one of those tunes that should breathe? Or am I just being lazy? Was it a musical decision? Was it an unconscious decision? Was it a conscious decision? Is this really the best way the song is going to work? You know, because as soon as you start involving other players, they're like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> what cloud are you on? Why is this working? Why is this not working? Like, you, you've got to let someone understand your vision. So then you've got to be able to count things. Same drummer. Another story. I'm singing a fill. And again, I'm on another song and I'm like, it's a really cool groove. And it's like a woman dancing on an island with fruit on her head. <laughs> and I'm singing the fill. You know, and I'm playing the song and I'm singing the fill and I sang it for two different drummers. And they looked at me like, what planet are you on? What are you, what are you saying? Right. I sang it for this drummer third drummer he goes oh you're singing and two and three and four and one and two and you want the crash on two that's a fill across the bar line I practice that kind of stuff all the time I know what you're doing that's why the other drummers weren't sure what you were doing I'm a freaking professor at the world most amazing music college I'm talking to three different drummers it doesn't even occur to me to count the thing to explain to them what I want. Do you see what I'm trying to tell you? It even happens to me. There is this artist side that just thinks good enough for rock and roll or I've got it or yeah, it's just this chord to that chord. But then, oh, the second time around, it doesn't go to that chord. It goes to this chord. Oh, the third time around, there's a third ending and I didn't take the coda. All these things freaking matter when it's your song. When you've written a tune and you've got a form in mind and you've got a sound in mind and you've got a groove in mind and you've got a key in mind or you've got a sound you want on the production in mind and people are not getting you, you are going to remember this class. You are going to remember this day and you're going to want to pull out the musician's skills that Berkeley is teaching you to say, this is how you communicate your ideas. This is why is it, it's important to understand how to read and write this musical language because there are people who won't even understand us with our words, but you can go anywhere in the world and play music and they will get you. They will be able to join in and get you because they know chords and they know melody and they know rhythm. Fascinating thing. It really is a language. So how embarrassed was I to think all I had to do was write down in two and three and four and one and two and everybody would have played it correctly. <laughs> it's quite a learning experience. It's humbling and it's very funny. And that's why I tell these stories because they're so, so important. Um, guitar, I think it's one of the hardest things for people to imitate somebody else and try to step into their thing. But I think it's a beneficial ear training tool. Have you done any other transcriptions, anybody, with any other classes or proficiency pieces where you had a sound like Stevie Ray Vaughan or, you know, uh, Steve Vai or, and did you notice, did you, did you realize what it taught your fingers and your ears how to do? Didn't it blow you away? Didn't it catapult your, your ability to like a whole new level? This is why holding yourself accountable and wanting to do that kind of work is so important. It's very important to develop your own sound. People would ask Pat Metheny this all the time. What do you think is better? Should I imitate people or should I come up with my own sound? Or how do I develop my own unique, how do I be me on guitar? You already are you. You already have fingerprints. You already have a personality. You already have a, a palette of what you think is good playing and good taste. 
you already are influenced by everything you've ever played, everything you've ever learned, everything you've ever heard, everything you've ever loved that you've heard, and everything you've ever disliked that you've heard. That kind of gives you the, this is getting warmer, this is getting colder, this tastes good to me, this tastes terrible to me. This is how this is developed. But you might have heard me say, you never would learn how to speak or write or talk. Well, talk is speak. You would never be able to read if somebody took you as a little newborn baby <laughs> and just gave you a thesaurus and a writing dictionary or a book on the alphabet and just said, have fun, little infant. Learn how to talk, learn how to walk, learn how to think, learn how to write songs all on, all on your own, you know. Do you think you would have amounted to where you are now? <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. You're not living under a rock. You've heard music since the time your ears developed, which was probably in the womb. I think that's the first thing that develops. And making sound and creating noises is something that we imitate. We all do it. Yeah. Did we do that thing where I said, t say the line, close the door? How many inf infinite ways can you say the line, close the door? If you were in a film and someone said, here's your line. Yeah. Close the door. Close the door. Close the door. Close the door. You know, like, <laughs> close the door. You know, uh, close the door. You know, like, <laughs> What are you feeling? What is the scene? What is the motivation? Who are you talking to? What just happened before? What just happened after? What is it supposed to be conveying at that point? You know, it's the same thing when you play a phrase or you play a couple of rhythms. What are you playing? What are you saying when you're playing it? Are you involved in it? Is your heart and soul in it? Do you care about it? You can tell. I can tell when somebody's playing something and it's sort of half paying attention to it or somebody's totally invested in it. You can tell when somebody's put time in on something. You can tell when somebody's practiced and when somebody hasn't. It's very easy. It's very important to videotape and audio tape yourself a lot and watch and listen and then say, you know, would I go pay to hear me? You know, is this as good as I think it is? Does this just feel good when I'm playing it or does it actually sound good when I'm actually just sitting back and listening too? If I just close my eyes and listen. There are a lot of great players like Pat Metheny who put themselves in the audience and he plays to himself. He's always trying to impress himself because he has such a high standard and he's such a perfectionist. And so that brings me around to my final point about him. Somebody actually asked him when he was there at Berkeley should I develop my own style or should I copy other people? And he said, you have to copy other people to learn how to play. Like Ben was saying, is it a slide? Is it a hammer on? Is it a pull off? Is it a finger uh, bend? You know, is it three fingers bending? Is it one finger bending? Is, is it a bend down? Is it a bound up? Was it done on the first string? Was it done on the second string? Was it an open string? Can you hear these differences? Yeah, that's, that's the stuff we're going for. That's what makes the personality come through uh, those choices but those people are not putting that much time into it it's just the way eric clapton plays it's just the way george benson plays it's just the way joe pass played but they played and heard things and they're embodying their influences right so you know it's like your own buffet you get to pick the players that are going to define you or help shape you and you do it consciously not necessarily unconsciously like see what your playing needs next see who you think might have something to offer you and then definitely talk about your playing with them and and get the good books and the good training and the good chord knowledge and the good ability you know we're talking about ability every time we go to play something and we want it to sound good that's the thing you're trying to develop you do have your own sound and your own personality but you want to be better at it whatever that turns out to be. So everybody picks sort of a different one. Pick one we haven't done. Pick one that takes you playing up a new, to a new beat level. If you haven't felt comfortable playing lead, play more lead. If you don't feel comfortable playing rhythm, play more rhythm. Uh, if there are certain chords or voicings or 
finger picking thing that you feel like you're not good enough yet, pick a song that takes your playing to a new space. Because when you learn that song, you learn that technique, and then your hands benefit from it. Of course, your ears benefit from it, and you actually get better. That's a very, very cool, important thing. Of course, wearing earplugs. Yes, always. Always, even with guitar amps and such. You know, I'm 60 years old and I haven't had any hearing loss and I've been a musician, you know, since I'm seven. So <laughs> uh, I've played with a lot of loud people. And most of the bands I've been in, the people in the band have had hearing loss. So they want their monitors really loud. But very often that's why I'm wearing noise canceling headphones and earplugs underneath. Because anybody else want to mention what instruments they play? Or I think it's cool. It's really fun. It really helps you understand all the work you've done so far. Because now you have to do some of that new work again <laughs> to get the new instrument together. But you know, there's a Zen saying from one thing, no 10,000 things. And it's not really the beginning because the whole musician that you're curating and developing and becoming, all that musicianship skills you bring to any new instrument that you want to play. So you, you already bring in a different sense of touch or an awareness or a listening ability or good ear, all those things, your understanding of harmony you already play a chordal instrument, so it'd probably be fun messing around with piano. And it is very interesting to sit back and play drums and not care about the chords. <laughs> like, are we at the bridge or are we at the verse? Or we're like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, it's just wonderful. Just let the band deal with that stuff. I'm just going to hold down the groove. I love this, you know. Oh, God, that's fun. <laughs> 